Good morning. I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution, and I'd like to welcome you today to our 10th annual John Hazen White Manufacturing Forum. And we have a Twitter feed set up at hashtag USMFG. That's USMFG. So if you'd like to post any comments or questions during the forum, uh, feel free to do so. This forum is supported by John Hayes and White. John and his wife Liz and sons uh, John and Ben are uh, with us and we wanna thank them for the financial support that they have provided over the years uh, that enables uh, the quality work that our scholars do and we are very grateful to them. Today, we're going to discuss what the Biden, what the Biden administration is doing to improve manufacturing. The good news is our country is coming out of the COVID pandemic, so businesses have reopened, consumers are spending money, and the economy is rebounding. Yet there remain a number of challenges in the manufacturing sector. Uh, these include supply chain issues, uh, where parts are coming from, and how to handle supply shortages. The whole question over made in America in terms of what that means and what the thres threshold uh, should be. Uh, and then finally, workforce staffing and development issues, so kind of the rise of advanced manufacturing and how we retrain workers for the new economy that is starting to emerge. To help us with these issues, we have put together a distinguished set of experts. We have two panels for today. And on our first panel, we are pleased to welcome three speakers. Monica Gorman is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Manufacturing Industry and Analysis in the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, she works on global supply chain issues and made in America questions. Prior to her public service, uh, she worked for a number of years at New Balance. David Cicilline is a congressman from Rhode Island. He was elected in 2006 and has risen to a top position within the House. Among his other responsibilities, he serves as chair of the House Antitrust Subcommittee. He is a leading advocate for manufacturing in America and has several key pieces of uh, legislation. But perhaps most importantly, today is his birthday. So happy birthday, Congressman. And we're delighted you're spending this special day with us at Brookings. Uh, and I should also note uh, that the House uh, will likely be having some votes this morning, so the Congressman may have to uh, sign off a little early. So just want the audience to know that. And then our final speaker is John Hazen White, who's the CEO of Takeo Comfort Solutions, uh, based in uh, Cranston, Rhode Island. Uh, he's been at the forefront of manufacturing, uh, worker retraining, and helping his employees uh, gain uh, new skills. He also is a uh, Brookings uh, trustee. So. I wanna start with Monica. So you work with President Biden on improving the manufacturing sector. I know there are a number of uh, new initiatives underway. So tell us what he and you are doing to improve manufacturing. Great, well, thanks so much, Daryl. And it's really a, a privilege to be here with such a distinguished panel. Um, I think I wanna start by just saying that particularly for manufacturers and for supply chain professionals, these are very interesting times. <laughs> Um, COVID highlighted to all of us the importance and the fragility of the global supply chains. And we now know um, very acutely that even small failures at one point can cause outsized impacts uh, further up the supply chain. Um, so supply chains can feel a little esoteric if you don't spend your day job working on them. But there's an old proverb that I think really illustrates this risk well. And it goes like this. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. And this proverb goes on and on until the entire kingdom is lost, all for the want of a horseshoe nail. So it's because of this that the Biden-Harris administration is taking steps to ensure that the United States can meet every challenge we face in this new era as we come out of the COVID pandemic. And a critical part of this is recognizing our own proverbial horseshoe nails. The president has made very clear that we can never again be in a position where we have to rely on countries that don't share our interests to protect our own people during a national emergency. And so to this end, on February 24th, as you know, the president signed an executive order launching a comprehensive review of U.S. supply chains and also directing federal agencies to identify ways to secure them against risks and vulner vulnerabilities. Um, and specifically, this EO ordered a 100-day review of four key products, semiconductors, which we led here at the Department of Commerce, 
critical minerals and materials, pharmaceuticals and their key ingredients, and advanced batteries like the ones used in electric vehicles. Um, this EO also initiated a long-term assessment of uh, the industrial base of six sectors over the next year. Again, the Department of Commerce is leading the one on the information and communication technology sector. And that's to identify additional substantive policy recommendations that will fortify supply chains in these critical industrial bases. Um, so again, as I mentioned, uh, Commerce was charged with leading the 100-day report on semiconductors and my office played a central role in this effort. Um, and to be honest, semiconductors are quite illustrative, I think, of the issue we are facing in supply chains and manufacturing writ large. So, I mean, semiconductors are computer chips. Um, they power all sorts of modern devices, um, including my phone and probably the phone that, that all of you have in front of you as well. Um, and a lot of you probably they also know that there's a shortage of semiconductors right now, and this has caused delays in the production of many types of consumer goods, in particular cars, um, which in turn has had a knock-on effect and has led to reduced hours for American auto workers. Um, the semiconductor it's, it, in itself, it's smaller than a postage stamp, um, but it has 8 billion transistors, um, which is each of which is 10,000 times thinner than a, smaller human, than a, than a single human hair. Um, they're amazing, but they're tiny. Um, and when they run short, I mean, when we don't have enough production of them, the semiconductor is essentially the epitome of a 21st century horseshoe nail. Um, so these reports were released in early June. Um, they're all available on the White House website, and I would really urge everyone to go read them. Um, certainly at least start with the executive summary, which highlights the themes that came out um, both across the reports and key themes within each report. Uh, but I think I'll close um, uh, my answer to your question just by touching on three of the, the themes that came out of um, all of the reports. So first and foremost, we know that building resilience in critical supply chains really means investing in American business, um, specifically in small and medium-sized enterprises, um, as well as increasing production of certain types of products here at home. So again, specifically for semiconductors, um, we know that Congress is on the verge of passing a bipartisan bill, which will invest more than $50 billion in domestic production and R&D for the semiconductor uh, industry and supply chain. Um, so we're certainly watching that with keen interest. Um, here at Commerce, we're also doubling down uh, to convene um, not just the semiconductor industry, but also the downstream users of semiconductors and other stakeholders to facilitate increased transparency along that supply chain communication and see how we can facilitate um, more trust um, throughout that long supply chain. Um, and I do wanna note, I mean, again, the semiconductor was invented right here in the United States. And while these chips will continue to be made globally, we do need to ensure that the United States remains at the forefront of leadership and research and development in this space. Um, it, investing in American manufacturing, though, is obviously broader than semiconductors. And again, um, as you know, the president, um, in his first few days in office, signed the Made in America executive order, and that directs federal agencies to buy U.S.-made products and services and strengthens the Buy American laws. Um, and this included establishing a Made in America office and the Office of Management and Budget. And that office also released its initial guidance early last month. Um, and again, I would urge everyone to read that. Um, it looks, for example, to, to close existing loopholes in the current Buy American laws. Um, second, I mean, we know that building resilience means doubling down on our investments in education and workforce training, and that's particularly STEM education at all levels. Um, we need that pathway for Americans into these good paying jobs. This is a theme that came out in every one of the 100 day reports. Um, and I would say it's, it's currently a key focus of US government policy, the policy process that's resulted from that work. Um, last but not least, um, we know that resilient global supply chains is also gonna mean looking beyond our own shores and working more closely with our trusted allies. Um, so even where products are made in America, um, they may rely on some components and materials that are not fully available within our borders. Um, to be honest, there's very few wholly domestic end-to-end -end supply chains. So this means that we need to work with our allies and our partners. Uh, we need to build that geographically diverse supply base um, and pursue partnerships in research and development across borders. Um, also to harmonize our policies to address market imbalances and also work together um, to address non-market actors. 
So I'll close there, but hopefully that gives you some of the key themes that are emerging from the initial work and would just say that this continues to be a, a major focus as the, the one-year reports are underway at the moment and we expect more to come out of that effort in the near future. Thank you, Monica. That's a great way to uh, kick off this conversation. And I do love the point about building resilience in America. So, for example, on the computer chip issue, you know, many people don't realize that most chips are now made either in Taiwan or South Korea, uh, both uh, very sensitive uh, places uh, these days. So enhancing U.S. capabilities uh, is uh, really crucial because almost everything, uh, every uh, device and uh, service today relies on uh, semiconductor. Uh, Congressman Cicilline, so I know you have been a longtime champion of American manufacturing, so I'd love to get your reactions to what we've seen so far of the uh, Biden agenda on manufacturing and also just what you think needs to get done. Uh, well, thank you again for including me and thank you to John Hazen White and Tinker for sponsoring this uh, forum each year. Um, and I really want to say that I think uh, what's been so extraordinary is the leadership of our new president who really it has distinguished himself very quickly as America's greatest manufacturing president. Uh, his executive order, his leadership on creating the Make It in America office is extraordinary. But Congress also responded to what Monica described that we all kind of saw during the uh, pandemic. This, I mean, Americans were wildly supportive of manufacturing and understood kind of intuitively how important it is to the American economy. But I think as people saw the struggle for PPE and for uh, other things that were necessary to beat back this virus, uh, they began to really put pressure on their elected officials to do something about it. And so in the CARES Act and in the American Rescue Plan, we included substantial support for American manufacturing. Uh, in the uh, CARES Act, we included, of course, uh, $350 billion in loans to small businesses, through the PPP program, of that much of that available, obviously, to manufacturers. We help companies keep employees through PPE and the Employee Retention Tax Credit. We direct the National Academic uh, to, to study the manufacturing supply chains of drug and medical devices and to provide Congress with recommendations to strengthen the U.S. manufacturing supply chain. We clarified that the strategic national stockpile can stockpile medical supplies. Uh, we clarified that during a public health emergency, a medical device manufacturer is required to submit information about a device shortage or device component shortage upon request of the FDA. And we allowed BARDA to more easily partner with private, the private sector on research and development. We then, in the uh, American Rescue Plan, included um, $10 billion uh, to enhance the Defense Production Act to boost domestic production of critical PPE to secure to secure supply chains and to increase capacity for vaccine uh, production and to help onshore production of rapid COVID-19 tests. We provided a $5.2 billion appropriation to the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, BARSA, to support advanced research development, manufacturing, production, and purchase of vaccines. And finally, we included $7.5 billion uh, for the Centers for Disease Control to uh, prepare, promote, distribute, administer, and track COVID-19 vaccines. So I think the pandemic uh, uh, caused us to include in those recovery packages critical investments in supply chain manufacturing. But I think more, maybe more importantly, it underscored the urgency of Congress really taking on this issue to make certain that we're doing everything we can to support American manufacturing. Having seen some of the consequences of the absence of manufacturing in our country and relying on some uh, other countries that maybe don't share our values in this really critical moment. Um, I think the president's executive order has been really important. Uh, I've been working for a number of years now and reintroduced legislation with Senator Murphy to close these loopholes and the Make It in America uh, by American requirements. And the president's commitment to that has been extraordinary. So I think this is a moment for a tremendous renaissance of American manufacturing. Uh, Congress understands the importance of it. We have a president who's leading on it. And of course, we have a secretary of commerce who hails from Rhode Island, the birthplace of the American industrial revolution. So a secretary of commerce who uh, will continue to be a leader on this. So I'm very bullish about uh, the work ahead and the progress we'll make in securing and growing American manufacturing. Thank you, Congressman. And certainly you're absolutely right in terms of 
the pandemic revealing all of the vulnerabilities. And I'll just add to that the pharmaceutical vulnerabilities because uh, much of our drug production uh, as well as uh, uh, protective uh, equipment for our healthcare providers uh, was made outside the United States. And uh, clearly that was a big problem, uh, especially at the beginning of uh, this. Uh, Johnny, uh, you're on the front lines of uh, innovation. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to get your uh, reactions uh, either to uh, Monica or Congressman Cicilline in terms of uh, the current situation, what the administration is thinking about, what Congress has done, and what you think needs to happen to improve manufacturing. Uh, Johnny, if you can unmute yourself, please. Sorry about that. That cost $5 in my world. Sorry. <laughs> the, um, uh, the comments by both uh, Monica and, 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 and Congressman Cicilline did are, are really spot on in, in so many respects. I think uh, I think we have to look back at the at the you know the year and a half or so as as some quite quite an, a, a unique period of time. Obviously, and so many things, uh, uh, so many problems arose from the beginning of this pandemic, as we all know, so many ways. But so many opportunities came up, and I think it's important to. But to realize that, I think that um, just prior to making some comments on that, I do want to comment on, on the, this very briefly. The Congressman, uh, David, we've spoken, I think, almost in every single uh, forum. Uh, you know, you and I have, have bantered about the issue of, of the Buy America uh, uh, program, and, and Monica's talked about this, too. And I think it's a very good thing. Uh, I'm 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 terribly concerned, as I have been, and, and mentioned this, that, that 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 we try to get it right because it's becoming more and more difficult. It has become more and more difficult for manufacturers like myself to really adhere to the Buy America uh, program in its in its current form. So I would caution you to be to be cognizant of the. I would reach out to find out what what that really means for, from people like myself because. Uh, uh, because you, you could, in fact, with all the right intentions, box us right out of being able to do business. You know, so so I, I would just pay attention. That's just a cautionary note and a thought. You know, uh, for what it's worth, I I can't. You know, I've always been based uh, that on material cost content, right, of a product, and where that was easy to to, to be able to do in the past. Not much of, of our core com components are made in America, so it kind of it puts us in a vulnerable position. My whole industry. Actually. So anyway, it's just just something for you guys to keep in, in mind and think about. I think that one of the things, uh, Daryl, that, that, that that's come out of the last year and a half has been our, our uh, some of the vulnerabilities in this uh, that, that, that have been exposed. Uh, uh, supply chain being the primary, you know, throughout the supply chain, the, the, the primary example. And Monica, you know, you, you talk about the, uh, the the microprocessors and the electronics and how that's impacting the auto industry. Well, let me tell you, every single circulator I make, I put one of those into, you know, and, and so we're running all over the place. Uh, uh, practically, you know, scratching at the, you know, like, like, like pigs for, for truffles or whatever, looking for, looking for these little, you know, uh, parts just to be able to keep ourselves going. So it's a, it's a real vulnerability. Now, I think it's really important, though, to, to note uh, the, your acknowledgement of, of the need to be able to work with our allies, because not everything can be made. And so uh, the notion, look, we boxed ourselves, kind of regulated ourselves. And I, I think this is a good thing in many ways, but regulated ourselves out of the foundry business to, to a large extent. We can't buy ca a steel and cast iron competitively. So we have to go to China. We have to go to Brazil. We have to go to Mexico. We have to go to different parts of the world to be able to, uh, to, to be competitive. And, and remember what I've always said, uh, David, is that the most important thing for manufacturers to be able to do is to buy materials at worldwide competitive prices. So it's, it's, just, it's just the nature of being a, a global, smaller world. Uh, but acknowledging the need to be able to do that is important, Monica. I think just moving ahead, you've got to keep that always in, in mind. We can't be totally focused on America only. It's not going not to ever work. Um, I think uh, if I might comment briefly, having gone through a, a horrible, horrible period, obviously, in the last year and a half, uh, the government has done uh, a really a tremendous job in doing what I what I always view the government as, as being being here for, which is to protect us, right? So, uh, so military and and um, infrastructure and whatnot. You know, um, I think the the, the 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 protection plans that have been put out, starting with the Trump administration, in fairness, and, and moving right on through, have been really uh, really productive. Uh, uh, we were we were a recipient of the, the PPP loan, and uh, and that act actually saved uh, 
saved a whole lot of jobs here. And, uh, and so I think the, the government did the right, uh, the right things. Um, I think um, in retrospect, I would, I would, I would probably do it all again uh, the same way. Uh, so, so I, I, um, uh, I commend you for, for, for what you've done. Um, I think that the one, the one thing I would want to acknowledge, and this is not just in the United States, but this is a worldwide uh, comment. Um, it's important to remember that one of the things that kept the world going, certainly kept America plowing ahead, was manufacturing. I mean, we made stuff. We never stopped. Uh, we were deemed essential in the beginning. And by the way, companies like mine were somewhere along the line deemed critically essential because we were supplying and, and moving hot water in hospitals and homes and nursing homes, which were keeping people alive, I guess, to some, you know, if you want to go there. And, and so I think uh, manufacturers kept a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the, the world going, uh, as I said, not just here, but, but uh, internationally. So I think it's very important. I, and I have said this a number of times here to my people, uh, who I have nothing but respect for and love, deep love, you all know that from, from the history. I have uh, said many times, and I uh, will say again, the people in the manufacturing world are nothing short of heroes for what they have done in the past year and a half. They show up at work every day, fearless. And for companies like Takeo and the rest of the world to have supported the safety of those people together, coming together to work together to, to prosper and grow and succeed and, and survive. Uh, these people are nothing short of heroes. And I, I don't wanna ever let that let lose sight of that fact because, uh, because I hold that very dear to my heart and will we'll be forever grateful for what these people have done. So uh, I commend what the government's done, Congressman. I commend, uh, 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 and, and, and Monica, I think what, you, what you've done and what you are doing is, is terrific and, and I thank you. And, and, and Daryl, I will leave it at that. Okay, uh, thank you, Jana, Johnny. So Monica, I have a two-part question for you. One on supply chains, one on that made in America. So in the supply chain area, I've heard three different concepts. Onshoring, Bringing, uh, which is basically bringing jobs back to America, nearshoring, which is bringing uh, a production back to places close to America, perhaps Canada, and then friend shoring, which is bringing production to American allies, even if they are halfway around the world. So I'm just curious how the administration is viewing onshoring, nearshoring, and friend shoring. And then on the made in America question, like, how would you respond to someone like Johnny or uh, other businesses who are worried about uh, either meeting that 51% uh, domestic content threshold, or you know there is legislation, including from the congressman, to raise that percentage figure? Um, so let me take your second question first. And I would stress the administration has been very clear that stakeholder engagement is a critical part of this discussion. Um, so as this policy process is happening, I would really encourage, um, John, your company and companies out there to engage with us. Um, I know I'm, I'm almost every day I'm in discussions with industry, but it's important that we have that feedback that helps to feed the policy process so that we can get it right. Um, we know this is challenging. There's a lot of factors that we're trying to balance. It's complex, um, but we need those different perspectives and voices. So um, so let's let's please have this discussion. Um, we'll keep the dialogue going and hopefully that helps us get it right as the policy process continues. Um, great question with regards to onshoring, nearshoring, and friendshoring. And I would say we're we're still in the earlier days of um, determining exactly how that is going to play out. Um, it's also quite supply chain and product or industry specific. So supply chains for different industries can look quite different. Um, some may need to all be in one general geography. Um, some can have more widespread geographies and that's okay. Some may need to be more regionally focused. And so that's part of what we're focused on right now is specifically with these critical industries and critical sectors of our industrial base. What, what are the areas that need to be onshored? What are the areas that need to be nearshored? And what are the areas where friendshored provides that resiliency that we're looking for. So it's, it's complex. Um, and again, just as with the Made in America, we're really seeking that feedback from the stakeholder community to help guide our process there. Um, but again, work is ongoing and uh, we, we, we invite perspectives to help inform that. 
Hey, thank you, Monica. Uh, Congressman, actually, the same questions for you, both on supply chain and made in America. I know uh, you have uh, legislation to close some of the loopholes. We currently do have a 51% domestic content requirement. So that is not new. That has been on the books for some time, but you would like to close some of the loopholes and perhaps even uh, raise that threshold higher. So how do we uh, do that? And then on the supply chain uh, issue, how do we navigate just all the complicated geopolitics of, 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 uh, uh, of manufacturing and material supplies? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the effort to make the Buy America uh, provisions work more effectively is to principally close the loopholes that have been developed over time that have just made it too easy for people to avoid buying American-made goods. And so I think there's bipartisan support to do that. Uh, and, and raising the, the requirement from 50 to 60 percent is an effort to be sure more manufacturing happens in the United States when you're using taxpayer money to buy those products and services. And it, is, it includes as well substantial resources to help American manufacturers who might not have the products or services that are currently need to be purchased. So part of it is making sure we buy American goods and supporting American manufacturers to develop products and services that might not currently be available in the United States. So it's really making a serious commitment to making sure we buy American by also helping manufacturers grow their business and develop new business lines. And, you know, I think the onshoring versus nearshoring versus friendshoring obviously involves lots of competing considerations in terms of our relationships with our allies. And that's why having somebody like Secretary Blinken leading our diplomatic work matters so much and experienced and thoughtful dip diplomat. Obviously from uh, kind of just the more immediate responsibility, our interest obviously is to bring as much manufacturing back to the United States to create and support good paying American manufacturing jobs in this country. But we recognize that there is value to uh, things that you've described as nearshoring and friendshoring, and all of them are better than having to rely on adversaries to produce things which are critical to the health and well being of our economy or the American people. But I think, just as a kind of local person who advocates on this, I think congressional interest is very much focused on onshoring. Uh, and thinking that kind of our chief responsibility is to respond to the economic devastation of this pandemic and helping uh, to create good union manufacturing jobs here in the United States. And, um, you know, the administration obviously is going to have to balance a number of other interests, and I know we'll do so well, um, but all those things are better than what we saw during the pandemic, and that is relying on some of our adversaries for critical components of our supply chain and for manufacturing. That's a great point. Adversary shoring uh, didn't seem to work out so well uh, during right. the uh, pandemic. Uh, so, uh, Johnny, your uh, thoughts on that? Like, you know, if we increase the domestic content requirement from 51 to 60 uh, percent. Uh, and, and by the way, if you look at public opinion surveys, actually, people love the concept of buy America. You know, it's very popular with the general public. Uh, workers uh, certainly uh, want jobs here so that they can keep their jobs and not have uh, their jobs be exported to other uh, countries. So uh, your uh, views on that, John? Well, I think, I think that's an admirable, uh, you know, goal. Certainly we all want to buy in America. Look, I manufacture everything from the United States and the United States basically. Uh, and then and to the extent I can, but please guys, this is not a hypothetical world. Somebody's got to run these businesses. So the, the goals and the, and the aspirations are terrific, but if I can't buy material at a competitive price, I can't compete. So I'm out of business. So we've got to, David and Monica, we've got to come to some resolution on some of this but beyond hypothetical. It's got to be real. And I'm glad you said this, Monica, but I would love to engage. I would love to engage in this conversation because I'm passionate about making things in America. It's what I've done. It's what I've built my life around. And by golly, I'll continue to. But I can't do it if I can't do it. So let's all be on the same page and, and get together and do that. I think, um, um, you know, I want to throw in a thought I had that while we're talking about the pandemic and by America, and the supply chain and everything, there's another issue at the front here for manufacturing, and that is uh, the ongoing evolution of the workforce. And I was thinking about this because I was thinking about our training programs, David and Daryl, you're, you're very well aware of those. And the uh, turnover in the baby boomer generation. 
right? And, and we're de now developing a whole new cast of, 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 of employees that we now have to bring into the company and, and try to teach the culture and, and perpetuate the culture. And so there's a whole nother element of moving forward as we come out of this pandemic, which is coincidentally at the same time, right? So, so, so there's, there, there's, I just throw that in before I forget it, Daryl, because I think there's, a, there's, there's more to talk about too, about how we come out of this thing and move forward. Uh, but uh, and and that's how we how we, we move ahead with with developing a a solid uh, workforce. And we're seeing that we're we're actually succeeding at this here. And it's it's uh, uh, but it's you know it's it's a new challenge for us. So anyway, just 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 uh, that's just simply a thought that popped in my head as I was uh, you know talking. But um, uh, and I love and that workforce development. You know, I, love, I love to I, I do love to talk, you know, So so I a lot of thoughts happen while that while that is going <laughs> Respond That's to that really okay. quickly. Um, you know, I think uh, Taco and I, under the leadership of Johnny and his dad before him, you know, has a reputation for extraordinary investments in their workforce. I mean, he has one of the lowest turnover rates probably in the, in the country because he really invests deeply in his, his workforce. And, you know, I think it's a, a lesson to the rest of the manufacturing world that, you know, the most valuable commodity they have and the most valuable resource they have are their employees. And Monica made references in her opening remarks. This workforce development piece is really critical. Part of that is making sure people have the skills because as you know, every time I visit a manufacturing facility, you see the new kinds of equipment that folks are using. It is very different. It is very sophisticated. It requires a very high level of training and expertise. But also, you know, we have to, again, remind people that manufacturing is a great career. I mean, manufacturing wages are higher than non-manufacturing wages. And sadly, I think we went through a period where, you know, people were discouraged from being manufactured because it was sort of seen as a dead end sort of uh, career path. I think that's changing in part because of great manufacturers in part because of a renewed interest in manufacturing, but also in part because of young people are part of this maker movement and it's, you know, making things is cool again, but I think we've got to just as a country understand valuing and being respectful of people who are work in manufacturing as a really treasured job and a vocation and a profession is something we need to continue to promote. And I think, you know, we talk about this every year there was a period in which we, if your kid came home and said, mom, dad, I want to go into manufacturing, they'd be like, what? Uh, I think that's finally changing and it should, should uh, but I think we just have to always be mindful of that. Okay, yeah, that is a great point from uh, issue about the importance of workforce development in this whole equation. So uh, we are starting to get uh, a number of questions from the uh, audience. So we're going to uh, move to some questions from uh, those individuals. And just a reminder, any of the uh, audience who would like to ask questions, you can do it uh, via our Twitter feed at hashtag USMFG, USMFG. So I have two questions that are kind of on the same topic. Uh, John, who's a professor at Purdue, wants to know, how can we envision enhancing the ability for small businesses and entrepreneurs to participate in the regional manufacturing resurgence? Uh, he's an engineering professor at Purdue. He says there are countless innovations that are potentially beneficial and disruptive technology, but he says the barrier to entry is just too high and the risk tolerance is low. And then Lori, who actually works for the Small Business Administration, has a related question, again, on the small business front. How are you integrating small businesses into these national efforts to create a more resilient supply chain? So Monica, Congressman, or Johnny, any thoughts on uh, that topic? I mean, I'm happy to, to kick off um, that I, I should say that SBA has been at the table at a number of these discussions and it is really important and we certainly see that here at Commerce that SBA is is continuing to be part of the discussions as we bring to life these investments um, that we're looking to see in certain supply chains. Um, another program I want to highlight that Commerce has is the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, um, which is a public-private partnership, really has just um, phenomenal success over the years and um, brings experts together with manufacturers to help them improve their operations, increase their profits, really sustain the business over time. Um, and it's just, it's had such tremendous success. I'll just make sure I get the numbers right here, but for every federal dollar invested, um, it generates nearly $20 of new sales growth and over $33 of new client investment. So that's, that's one vehicle that we have that can really help manufacturers 
enhance and grow and expand and sustain their business over time. Um, there's a lot more that we can do, um, but those are a, a couple of ways that we're working today uh, to try to, to enable our small businesses to grow. Yeah, I, I would just add uh, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership is a huge success, um, has been really impactful. I've uh, actually introduced two pieces of legislation to build on what I've seen in that. The one that I plan to reintroduce in this Congress, the Make It in America Manufacturing Act, which will encourage kind of regional uh, public-private partnerships to really um, help support uh, manufacturing growth. And the New England Regional Commission, which is a piece of legislation that will allow Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, this is just an example, uh, to come together uh, and receive federal funds specifically to help uh, spur regional economic development. Because I think one of the challenges, and particularly in manufacturing, I think one of the challenges we see in economic development broadly is that so much of it is designed around state boundaries. And so there's not a lot of incentive to think about this regionally because everyone measures jobs in their own state and unemployment in their own state and governors do that. But you know, that's not the way economies typically work, especially manufacturing economies. And so the New England Regional Commission Act will create this regional commission that will allow these three states to really think about manufacturing regionally and do good planning and investments that will help spur manufacturing growth in that region, which is a lot more uh, effective and impactful. So I think, you know, those kinds of things can help uh, spur economic growth in the manufacturing sector in a regional way. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Beth has a two-part question. Uh, one is about uh, the U.S. Manufacturing R&D Innovation Center. So she wants to know whether they are having a positive impact on building uh, manufacturing uh, innovation. And then her second question uh, relates to uh, electric vehicles and transportation. She wants to uh, know the intersection of semiconductors, critical minerals, and advanced battery supply chains, and how the administration will address the geopolitical aspects of building electric vehicles. Can I jump in, Daryl, just really quickly on the-, on the Yep, on absolutely. The first part of that, I, I know nothing about electric vehicles. On the, on the uh, first part of that, the innovation centers, which I, I think we call make, make, make places or whatever, the, you know, the local, that, that um, they are very beneficial. And it ties back to the last conversation about uh, uh, how, how, how difficult it is to, to bring a new business you know, forward and, and the barriers to entry are, are certainly there, but these, uh, these make rooms of these innovation centers are so important and they really are very local. They're very local all over the place. I think uh, something that can be reached out to for, for help by anybody and to the professor's question to, uh, to, to, to aid and assist in, in the development from soup to nuts, from R&D through marketing, through, through sales, through uh, accounting and everything else. So I think those places are available and, and uh, uh, and should be reached out to. I think that uh, also the, the Brookings has done a, an extensive job over the over the past in, in the Metro Studies program. Was that what it was called, Daryl? Yes. And, and uh, you remember he was focused on um, on uh, that was focused on you know regionalizing certain manufacturing uh, segments. So uh, uh, I guess Monica, like 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 semiconductors might be Silicon Valley, but you know something else might be around Pittsburgh, something else might be around Chicago, where, you know, you, you, your source of supply and your complete product are all sort of localized, so at least to some extent. And it's an interesting comment to me, because for, for somebody trying to get into a business, I would go, if that was available, to a local place, like, you know, and, and uh, pretty simply said, but you, you, I think you get my point. And uh, so I can, you know, on electric cars, I can't, by the way, Daryl, if I could just throw one thing in, when you introduced me in this thing, you said I was a CEO. I'm not the CEO. Cheryl Merchant is the CEO. Uh, I just happen to own the joint. But anyway, I think well, that's probably, that's a better job. I believe. I've stepped off, I've stepped <laughs> off the plank into the uh, shark infested waters. But anyway, okay, thank you for that correction. Uh, Monica or uh, the Congressman on electric vehicles and uh, innovation hubs. I mean, I'll take the, I think there was a question, the question also touched on critical minerals, semiconductors, advanced batteries, and how those supply chains relate. And it's, it's a great, um, it's a, a really great question. If you think about the, just the 100-day reports mandated by the EO, those are exactly the sectors that were mandated. Critical minerals is interesting because it underpins so many of these other sectors. So critical minerals, critical materials go into semiconductors. They also go into advanced batteries. And so that is one, think about it as a foundational layer 
Um, coming out of the studies that were done, there are a number of different work streams now, specifically on critical minerals, but also how they connect to these other key sectors. Um, it can be very sector specific, but if you think about advanced batteries, um, we're starting to see more announcements of um, battery manufacturing plants being stood up because it is so critical to auto manufacturing and EV um, electric vehicles. So again, it really depends based on the sector, um, but I think specifically around advanced batteries, you're going to see a desire to see more onshoring of that because having that vertical supply chain is so important to EVs. Um, similarly with semiconductors, again, the chip tech funding would drive a lot more manufacturing here. Um, we need to have that. We need to have that uh, manufacturing here. We need to be able to make, uh, make those leading edge chips here as well, which we don't currently today. Um, in the case of minerals, I mean, minerals are in the ground where they are in the ground. So we may be able to get some here. Some will have to be in the locations where they are. And so in that sense, we're, we have to look at the geographies where those minerals exist. Um, but again, I just, it, it's very industry and sector specific. And so we're really trying to be thoughtful as we take the work that came out of the, the initial research that was done and, and drive the policy process forward. So my Brookings colleague, Mark Miro of our Metro program has a question. He would like to get your thoughts on how the contemplated policies can deepen U.S. technology innovation and particularly regional supply chain density, which he thinks is a very important factor in improving manufacturing. Is that to me, Daryl? Uh, any of our panelists who would like to react. Don't be shy. <laughs> We're relying on Monica's expertise. Well, I, I will make one comment in that, again, certain industries really need that localization and vertical supply chain. And so that by definition is going to drive more regional density. Um, we also know that manufacturing and R&D innovation go hand in hand. Um, when you've got your, your innovation center right next to your factory, that, that is a virtuous circle that happens um, when the people on the floor are talking to the people doing the research and development. So we see building more of those centers as this gets stood up in different industries and different areas really creates that virtuous cycle. Yeah, and I, the only thing I would add, Daryl, is I think that's why the two efforts I mentioned about this sort of regional economic development, both in terms of planning and in terms of you know, federal resources being devoted to regions is so critical. And so I think uh, we just have to sort of get out of the political way of thinking about the way we measure all these things because that's the way economies work. And I think uh, uh, Monica made that point again. Okay, thank you. So Sandra of an organization called Personal Cities has a question about green technologies and green initiatives, which of course is a, a big part of the broader manufacturing agenda as well. Uh, she wants to know what new technologies are being used to improve manufacturing efficiency and increase green initiatives? Green initiatives? Green initiatives. So I just you jump in and you guys can comment from, the, from, from that side of the, but I would say briefly that almost everything that's happening in development of, of products in any in any area that I can imagine has to do with uh, with 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 a green focus. In other words, so so I'm in the in the HVAC business. I'm developing pumps and valves for heating and cooling, air conditioning, and water movement. Every single thing we do is designed for number one comfort, but but really number one plus would be would be energy efficiency and and uh, uh, and, and green sustainability. So. So uh, rest assured that everything that's happening, and some of that, by the way, some of that is regulated. A lot of it's regulated, actually, by the government, and that's and that's a good thing because it keeps it, you know keeps the leaders leading, and, and the rest of, of doing the same, you know, trying to keep up. Uh, but some is just done because it's the right thing. You know, it's kind of like solar. Right? If you're going to put solar on your house or in your building, is it necessarily economically feasible? No, not always. But you know what? It's the right thing. And a lot of people do things for that reason. So, uh, so that would be my comment. Every single thing that's happening I, that I know of in development is revolving around, uh, I'm going to call it environment. 
I would just add to that. I mean, it, we see a tremendous opportunity here in terms of our climate goals and economic development potential um, around clean tech and um, sort of clean industries. So you think everything from things that drive energy efficiency to green steel and green cement, um, abatement technologies, um, renewables is an obvious one. But I mean, the US really are, there's no bounds to American ingenuity. And we lead in so many of these technologies, particularly driving new technologies. So it's a tremendous opportunity, both for more manufacturing, more exports, um, but also to help our manufacturers here at home as we continue to make our, our, our own industries more efficient. So it's I, we just see a, a tremendous opportunity as we take this forward. And, and the only thing I would add to that, and that's why it's so important that the government really continue to provide robust research and development dollars because so much of our success in this area is, you know, new innovations, new products, you know, uh, sustainable materials that Monica mentioned. So having a very robust research and development uh, investment is really critical to all of this. So another question from our audience, Thomas, who is a policy analyst at the Duke University Center for Health Policy says, Onshoring production of essential goods is critical, but he says manufacturing quality issues still can arise in the United States, uh, particularly, he notes, in the pharmaceutical area. So he wants to know what steps can we take to ensure continued quality in production as we shift more manufacturing back to the United States? That's investment in, in, in productivity. I'll go right there very, very simply put, because I, I look back at the history of this company as a microcosm of what you're talking about. And, you know, um, as we've come through the last 40 years, it's been continual investment in, 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 in two things. Uh, design. I don't know about pharmaceuticals. I have no knowledge of that, but I do know about things like that. And, you know, the, the design for manufacturability and, uh, um, uh, the production processes for manufacturability and quality are critical because you can make a product that, uh, that, that cannot fail going out of a factory, which is what we've strived to do. So it's all about uh, investment in, in the process. Bringing things back is going to be about investment in process. And by the way, where we can improve over some of the, what do you call them, adversary uh, sourcing? What do you call it? Yes. Spending and Mending and adversary sources. Other acronyms were, but the, but the production the in adversarial nations. Adversarial nations, right? I mean, the, the, those are very, very, very manual, and there are real quality issues coming from some of those places. Believe me, I, I've lived with them all, all my life. But, but um, uh, so, but back here we have the opportunity to invest. In, so, so you would worry more about the quality issues elsewhere as opposed to the United States. They're harder to control because they're not at your fingertips. Right. I mean, you can control them. Sure, we, we do we work very hard at that. But being right here and investing in what we can uh, uh, for production is, is, has been has been absolutely a, a no question. Uh, Buckley of the Wisconsin Center for Manufacturing has a question. He wants to know, what are the most transformational ways the administration can invest in U.S. manufacturing? So obviously there's a lot of initiatives going on across the board. I think he wants your uh, top hits, uh, like what's the most important thing that actually would transform the nature of manufacturing? Monica, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um... I, I would say it's twofold. One, it is continued focused investment on research and development. Um, the U.S. leads in so many key technologies. There is there is nothing that can match American ingenuity. We need to continue to invest in that in so many different industries. The other as aspect of that, though, is continuing to support the commercialization of that and the ongoing manufacturing of those technologies once we invent them. And so that's where um, we're looking at a number of different industries to make sure we can continue to do that, um, semiconductors being a key example. So research and development, but then supporting that commercialization and continued manufacturing. And may I just add one thing, Daryl? I think absolutely those are the right uh, two first priorities. I think the third kind of immediate uh, way to do that is a substantial, big, bold infrastructure package that includes strong Buy America provisions that will help rebuild the crumbling infrastructure of America, help support American manufacturing in a very profound way. And that's just what the president has proposed. 
Okay. And Congressman, I think you may have a vote coming up and you may need to uh, jump in my up. committee yeah. in my committee. Yes. But we uh, appreciate your uh, contribution and hope you enjoy your birthday today. Thank you. Great to see you. Great to be with Thank you, Monica David. and Johnny. Thank you, David. Uh, so the congressman mentioned this issue of infrastructure. So uh, Johnny and Monica would love to get your thoughts. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of discussion in Washington now about infrastructure uh, broadly defined, but I'm just curious the manufacturing part of that and what the government should be doing to improve infrastructure in a way that will enhance manufacturing. So it's critical that we see the infrastructure bill passed. Um, the president's been very clear. It's an ambitious agenda and it, it does envision U.S. manufacturers providing those products, American product, American uh, manufacturers being able to do it. So it's going to drive demand for products that are being made here. Um, the need for it, I think, is self-evident, um, but it, it is absolutely critical that we do this. It provides us a way to invest in our country and to do so with American labor um, and American products. I, I, uh, uh, there's no question for the need. This is what government should be focused on to, to some extent, as I said before, you know, protection. And, uh, Johnny, if you could lean a little closer to your microphone yeah, so we could hear you better. So I think this is what, uh, what, what, what one of the key roles of government is to, is to protect us uh, and, and to and to keep our infrastructure whole and, and solid, and uh, uh, so this investment is is really important as long as it's kept focused on on infrastructure and doesn't go you know floating off into other areas. But uh, but I think that um, uh, the investment in this, I've, I've had an awful lot of conversations because a lot of the infrastructure that's going to happen, uh, the infrastructure investment is going to happen relates to, to frankly, to, to moving water. I'm telling you, whether it's wastewater, sewerage, whatever. So I've been actively, we've been actively involved in these conversations. And this is a really important step because I know, Daryl, I was talking to somebody the other day. I think you were with me. The guy was talking about the manhole covers in Washington having 1849 on them and stuff like that. From I mean, this is pretty old stuff that has to be fixed and replaced or the whole nation is going to crumble right under us. So uh, so, and I think uh, um, the, the, the opportunity for American job creation through this investment is very real. I mean, I look at the, in any segment of the infrastructure bill you're looking at, uh, the addition of jobs to support that is going to be um, significant and substantial. So, so that, that in and of itself uh, is an important reason for doing this. I, I just hope it's pure. That, that's all without a lot of pork in it. So, but I mean, that's just a layman speak, but, but, um, but I think it's really important. Okay, I have a couple of questions that relate to the same uh, theme of equity. Uh, Angela says manufacturing is often thought of as a man's world. Uh, so she wants to know how can more uh, women uh, be included as owners and uh, managers and uh, paid employees? And then Zach, who works at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, has a related question about what the government can do to promote greater equity, gender, racial, and geographic equity throughout the supply chain. Um, great questions. And I, I would start by saying equity is an overarching theme that is driving so much of the work that we're doing. Um, a key way in which we will want to do this is through workforce development, making sure that we are training a diverse workforce at the outset. So in our schools, in our, um, our community colleges, in our universities, um, that we are, we are making jobs that go into manufacturing, something that people from all different backgrounds want to join. Um, so I think that's probably the, that underpins all of this. Um, we can continue to encourage, um, folks who come into these jobs to stay. I mean, these are, these are great jobs. There's a lot of opportunity to grow. John, you see that within your business. Um, so we wanna make sure that um, folks of all backgrounds and um, they really see that opportunity to grow within manufacturing. But again, it really starts with a focus on equity in workforce development, in the schools and the, the programs where um, people gain the skills to go into these jobs and then keeping them in manufacturing as they rise throughout their careers. Johnny, you have a female CEO, so. A female all over the place. I mean, 
And I, you know, I mean, it, we're very diverse that way. It's been a great Again, day. if you could lean a little bit closer yeah, to your mic. So sorry, sorry. I'm, maybe, maybe I'm glad you didn't hear my comment. We, but we, yes, we have lots of, look, you know, the country has been built on opportunity. And so one of the great opportunities for a person like me is to provide opportunity for people. So TACO has been open and most places that should, I wish every place were the same, open to anybody, anybody to, to, to come in and learn and grow and develop and build a life for themselves and their families, whether they're a man or woman, I don't care. It's just about, uh, and, 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 I, and I, so I think the answer to the question, and Monica, I think it's important that the government have a role in that somehow. We see it and developing more and more, but you know what? It's also a mindset of ownership. It really is a mindset of ownership to, to, to be willing to open up our doors and let people come and enjoy the, the opportunities that are pro provided and, and take advantage, and then we'll support that. It's just like the education, Daryl, that we've had here over the years. That's, that's uh, something for everybody and, and to grow and, and, and achieve. And, and, and my dream in, in my life has always been to provide a place where people can come and grow and prosper and their families can grow and prosper with them. And, uh, and so uh, uh, that's a mindset too, to some extent. You can't regulate that. You can't regulate mindset. Okay, I have one last question for you and then we're gonna move to our second uh, panel. So uh, Dilip has a question about China and basically he believes China is way ahead of the United States on manufacturing in general. So he wants to know, can the U.S. even conceive of catching up with manufacturing in China? Uh, can we catch up with China? Is that the question? On manufacturing in particular. Absolutely. Yes. But we're ahead of, we really are in many ways ahead of them. They, they picked they pick and showed uh, certain areas to invest and they've done well, but I, I think we can absolutely uh, uh, maintain the, the leadership in the world in manufacturing. I have no doubt. I, I, would, I would strongly agree. And I think it's less of a race and more of how are we going to out-innovate? I agree. Um, that, is, that is what we do best. Um, and we will, we will absolutely out innovate. Okay, I love your optimism on uh, that front. So uh, we will uh, end uh, the panel on that optimistic note. But I, I want to thank uh, Monica for sharing her uh, thoughts uh, with us, and uh, definitely uh, good luck at the Department of Commerce and the various uh, initiatives that you have underway. And uh, John, thank you very much for sharing your perspectives from the uh, front lines. Uh, very Monica, if I may, just really quickly before you wrap up. Uh, but please involve people like me in the discussion on Buy America. It is so critical that we do it right. Absolutely. Let's let's chat after this. We we'll welcome the conversation. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thanks to uh, both of you, and uh, also with our audience, we appreciate all of your uh, questions as well. So we now are going to transition to a second uh, panel, which is going to continue this discussion about manufacturing in the United States. Uh, what the Biden administration is doing, uh, how we can uh, do a better job to promote uh, manufacturing. And we're very pleased to have two distinguished experts on this part of the uh, conversation. Uh, so uh, Ben, you can already see on the screen, uh, Ben Wang holds the Guatney Chair in Manufacturing Systems at Georgia Tech uh, University. He teaches in the Stewart School of Industrial and Systems Engineering and he is a professor of materials science and engineering at Georgia Tech. He's also the executive director of the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute. Uh, ben, that sounds like you have uh, several full-time jobs there. Uh, we're also delighted uh, to welcome uh, Liz Reynolds uh, with us. Uh, she is a special assistant to the president for manufacturing and economic development at the National Economic Council of the uh, White House uh, in uh, obviously, he's in the middle of many of the things that uh, the uh, Biden administration is uh, doing to promote uh, manufacturing. So, Liz, uh, we will start with you. So, uh, we have several interesting manufacturing uh, initiatives uh, uh, emanating from the White House in terms of supply chain, made in America, and workforce uh, development. In our last panel, we talked a lot about supply chain and made in America uh, issues. I'm just curious uh, what you're working on in particular, uh, some of the uh, perhaps workforce development initiatives that you think will be helpful. Uh, I know there's a lot of R&D investments uh, taking place. There's gonna be a new National Science Foundation Directorate on technology uh, if uh, Congress uh, uh, 
agrees to this, uh, and just how these various things are designed to help the manufacturing sector. Well, thank you, Daryl. It's a real pleasure to be here and also to be with Ben on this panel and fully enjoyed the previous panel as well. And um, want to make sure I'm not too repetitive of that, but I think it's worth stepping back for a moment before we talk about the entire uh, agenda and how manufacturing fits into it um, for the Biden administration and, and really sort of take stock to say, you know, where are we today and what are we looking at going forward? I think the pandemic exposed as the supply chain work has discussed really exposed some critical vulnerabilities that we've seen in our supply chains and our industrial base, you know, from the PPE to the semiconductors. And, but, but while those were exacerbated, they really have been with us for years. And they're reflective of a lot of policies and uh, practices that were driven a lot by concerns uh, that were primarily dominated by efficiency, maybe short-term goals, as opposed to building resiliency, uh, focus on long-term growth uh, and innovation. And so, the Biden administration has really laid out what I think we could consider a revised or reformed industrial strategy. Industrial strategies have been with us since Alexander Hamilton, but one in which we really see a robust role for government uh, working in partnership with the private sector. And I think that this is, um, you know, this is a critical part of the administration's agenda, and we can talk through what all of those are, but it's coming at a critical time. I think maybe uh, I'm sure the audience has seen some of these recent numbers on manufacturing productivity uh, in the country. It, we have seen a decline in the last decade across um, the majority of industries here. Um, we have lost uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of small and medium-sized manufacturers, particularly between 2000. Uh, and 2010, that uh, challenging decade. Um, we've seen a decline in our um, in entrance, so to speak, for the workforce and the challenges we have in terms of building a talented pipeline. And so for all of these reasons, I think we are at a, a moment in time where this agenda is more important uh, than ever. And this agenda, as you, um, as sort of has been touched upon in the previous panel, I think it's got uh, four primary um, sort of pillars, if you will. One is around growth and innovation. We have to improve our um, productivity growth in our companies, and we have to um, lean into our innovation capabilities, which I think um, people have spoken about in the previous panel. The second area in my mind is know-how. It's one thing to be investing and providing capital and, um, and incentives and things. The other part is the know-how. We know that uh, firms need, you know, you learn through building. And that learning curve can take time. And particularly for our small and medium-sized firms, it's not just about capital, but it's about what kind, of, um, what kind of assistance do we give them? What kind of guidance do we have about integration of new technologies? The know-how part, I think, is something we've lost when we've lost a lot of our manufacturing offshore. The third area is workforce. And I think when I think about workforce, we obviously, obviously are talking about that pipeline. Um, but we also know that the um, issues of Industry 4.0 are really about organizational transformation. So we need to train a new workforce, but I'd also say we also have to be thinking about um, management as well. And just a whole different way of thinking about how we manufacture in the country. And then fourth, all of this has a geographic dimension. And there's, if you're helping manufacturing, uh, you're helping middle America in this country. We've got at least 50% of, um, of our machinery um, firms, are located and plastics metals uh, companies are located in, um, I think it's about, well, maybe I've got um, in about 30% of our counties in this country, we've got a tremendous concentrations in different parts of the region. And so these regional approaches are really valuable for our manufacturing agenda. So in terms of the agenda itself, uh, we've seen, you know, one piece is very um, squarely placed on the R&D agenda and the innovation. And we've seen that in the USICA bill particularly around this tech directorate, which I'm very excited about. I think it's really taking all of our excellent skills in, in basic research and trying to then bring that to an applied, uh, applied context. We have a lot of good experience in this in, in DARPA and ARPA-E. Uh, also, you've heard about the supply chain agenda and what we're doing with the supply chain resiliency program, how to invest in our supply chains, where we saw a lot of vulnerabilities in this first round of research, but they exist across multiple multiple areas. And it's got a, both a domestic agenda, but it's also got an international agenda. Uh, third, I think, is, the, is what I'd call the geographic dimension of investing in manufacturing. That is the innovation hubs, which are a very exciting way of taking what we've learned to date about regional clusters and how we build 
um, coalitions and deepen our um, access or, or our ability to bring sort of growth to regions that are not necessarily, you know, um, our top tech areas, but are also going deeper geographically and also going deeper in terms of bringing in um, greater racial equity, uh, gender equity. Uh, then the work of the MEPs and the uh, Manufacturing USAs, uh, two of the critical institutions that spread across the country for us, uh, that touch a lot of different communities that are also um, able to, again, provide that know-how, I think, for companies, which is really important. Uh, we mentioned, I think Monica mentioned as well, the CHIPS Act and what we're doing specifically around semiconductors. We then also have a huge investment um, and opportunity in the workforce development piece. We've talked about that, I think, in, in, the previous, um, in the previous panel, but how do we bring the next generation through that talent pipeline? Um, procurement, which also was mentioned, a, a critical piece here, I think is an opportunity for uh, providing some demand side opportunities for our manufacturers. And then finally, indirectly, I think it was really important that question from the last panel on infrastructure. It, that infrastructure agenda is indirectly a manufacturing agenda in so many ways. It's both helping our manufacturers through the investment in that in kind of critical infrastructure, but also I think there's going to be opportunities for uh, U.S. manufacturers. So um, it's a very you know it's a you could look through this uh, the, the administration's lens. If you just look through the manufacturing lens, you just see um, you know that this is one critical piece of the of the pillar of that uh, of that agenda. And so. Um, so it's really, I think it's a once in a generation moment for our manufacturing. And, and I think there's consensus across the board that we can't continue in the way we have been. Uh, again, given the way that technolo technology is changing, given uh, global competition, um, given the needs of our national security, our economic security, our innovation agenda, this has got to be a new way and a new trajectory for our um, approach to manufacturing. Great points, Liz. Uh, thank you very much. So Ben, I want to bring you into the conversation. So Liz is emphasizing a number of different areas, but especially the importance of innovation and the importance of workforce development. And I know you are in the middle of each of those issues. Uh, you uh, are very much uh, interested in extending the uh, uh, manufacturing innovation uh, ecosystem. And then on the workforce side, uh, you are a professor. Uh, so you are actually training uh, the next generation of uh, young people. So I'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, both on the innovation side, as well as the uh, workforce development side. Thank you very much, Daryl, for having me on the program. I'm really honored uh, to be part of this important dialogue with Liz and the audiences, uh, because advanced manufacturing is foundational to our economic prosperity, uh, resilience, and national security. Well, uh, by, by way of introduction, I was involved in the Obama administration's advanced manufacturing partnership, M1 and M2, from 2011 uh, to 2013. And uh, it is obvious that I'm extremely pleased that the current administration is taking important and very much needed steps and also taking an intentional strategy and approach okay, to expanding our technology innovation ecosystem and the manufacturing supply chains. Um, Daryl, if I may, before addressing uh, the questions, and I would like to say from the get-go that my comments are grounded in uh, a few re beliefs, okay, so that the audience know where I stand on the manufacturing policies. And first, uh, building a strong manufacturing base in the US is a national imperative, okay? And we know that technology-based innovation is the dominant driver of economic growth in the 21st century. In addition to economic growth, supply chain resilience, as Liz mentioned, national security standard of living and rebuilding the middle class in our society all depend on a strong globally competitive manufacturing base. In order to have such a competitive manufacturing base, we need a vibrant innovation value chain tightly coupled with a strong manufacturing ecosystem. Okay, so that leads to my second belief, we cannot separate innovation from manufacturing. Okay. In the past, some policymakers believed that we could continue to innovate and leave manufacturing to other nations. As it turned out, 
not only did we lose our ability to produce high-tech products, we began to lose our ability to innovate. Okay, as the former Dow Chemical Chairman and CEO Andrew Liberis, and he co-chaired the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership Steering Committee. And he notes in his book, where manufacturing goes, innovation inevitably follows. Okay, so if we want to compete well globally, we must maintain both the technological innovation leadership and advanced manufacturing leadership. And the third one is the importance of the medium size and the small manufacturers in the US, they contribute to our supply chains and the GDP in a significant way, but oftentimes they lack the resources to evaluate and adopt new manufacturing technologies. Okay. And we continue to develop many state-of-the-art technologies. And how do we get these new technologies in the hands of these small and medium-sized manufacturers? In other words, how do we overcome the last mile challenge in technology adoption by these small medium-sized companies? I believe the national and the state MEP can play a critical role in it. Okay. So that's, uh, uh, so let, let me comment on the, uh, the regional manufacturing, uh, the ecosystems. And I wanna emphasize the importance of taking a regional approach to uh, developing the manufacturing ecosystem. Again, connecting the existing program with the new ones and then align them with the state agencies for economic development, uh, EWDs and two-year colleges and four-year universities, state MEPs and the many wonderful local not-for-profit organizations. Okay. So the regional ecosystem stakeholders should come together and determine what they want to compete on. Is it the talent? Is it the infrastructure? Is it the supply chain? Or is it the business climate? And uh, I mean, this regional ecosystem approach is time tested. Uh, Liz and her team uh, at IPC at MIT did wonderful work. Uh, Michael Porter's work on uh, innovation clusters and Pisano and she's work Okay, so all these are great example to prove that the regional approach actually works and works well, uh, particularly for the US. So the regional ecosystem actors must work together to identify common challenges and common opportunities, and then co-innovate around those common challenges and opportunities. And this regional approach actually pushes local companies to rethink how they should interact with one another to ensure that benefits are shared by all. In other words, they should grow and excel symbiotically if they have a right combination of technologies, workforce, infrastructure regulation standards, and uh, some uh, uh, other policy, for instance, the tax uh, incentives. Now, um, as you know, I'm a big fan of the, uh, uh, the regional approach, okay? But I also want to mention that uh, the use of proper metrics to measure the health of the manufacturing ecosystem is essential. Okay, without the proper metrics, we don't know where we are and we don't know where we are going. Um, well, there's a good example of the metrics driven approach and that is called the Tech Fire Ecosystem Assessment Tool developed by Energetic Technology Center. So the TechFire is a comprehensive tool that evaluates many indicators uh, from investment to incubators, to minority participation, to uh, workforce uh, training. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, Liz, if I can bring you uh, back in. In your opening remarks, you emphasize geography and some of the geographical challenges we face, that uh, there are problems in middle America in the sense that the jobs are not equally spread all across the uh, country and that fuels uh, resentment. And one of the things the administration is trying to do is to uh, promote heartland uh, development and uh, kind of a more equitable uh, spread. And I know you've done uh, work on uh, these uh, topics in the past as well. So tell us a little bit more about the geography angle the regional innovation hubs, and how the administration hopes to build greater equity in the system as a whole. 
Well, I have to say for those of us who have done regional uh, economic development for decades, um, it's a very exciting time to be in this administration because I think there's a real understanding and embrace of this approach toward economic development. Our, our country's um, economic security and, and growth is really built upon regional strength. That's where we find, you know, we have all of these centers of excellence, if you will, that drive, uh, drive our competitiveness globally. So the regional model is one, as, as Ben said, has been, I think, well-tested. Every state in the country, every region has, you know, built again on this concept of, uh, of clusters. The, the challenge often is that there's, there are nascent clusters there, but we just don't have the, necessarily the resources to take, take, take the kind of growth or the opportunity to the next level. And the other challenge has been also making sure that we're including um, the broader, the broader um, communities, if you will, or, um, or parts of a, a regional economy. I think both of those things are things that this new regional um, tech innovation hub model is really trying to address. So it's about taking, uh, building on innovation and technology-based solutions to or, or growth opportunities, taking them out of our traditional uh, tech hubs, if you will, that we often find on the East and West Coast and saying, let's go find those assets that exist in other parts of the country. Uh, let's go build upon what already we know exists in smaller areas and rural areas, in um, cities that may be um, smaller cities, but have um, strengths in, in, in different uh, areas of, of uh, technology. And then let's ensure, and this is part of the part of the Tech Hub model, let's ensure that the engagement across sort of uh, partners, as Ben was talking about, is a broad engagement and is bringing in um, different or, or sort of not the usual suspects into our thinking. Because I think often we, um, the manufacturing agenda is one, it builds on a legacy, right? And that legacy is um, place-based in, in, in many places, but it's also based in particular communities. Um, and we need to sort of expand beyond that, whether that's a racial expansion, a gender expansion, or an expansion beyond particular uh, communities. So the model I think is one that has, uh, is built on strong foundation, but is trying to, I think, go to the next level and push us a little further to figure out how does this work in different places around the country. And certainly one of the silver linings of the last year via remote work has been geographic in the sense that one no longer has to live in Boston or Seattle to work in the tech sector. It may be as we are moving uh, more generally into either a hybrid model or a fully remote uh, model that that will actually help create greater geographic equity and uh, help uh, help you accomplish some of the things that you would like to uh, do. And Ben, on the workforce development part, so you teach at Georgia Tech, you're in the front lines of educating the uh, next uh, generation of uh, young people. Uh, what are you telling them and what do they need to do and how can we help support them uh, in order to help develop the manufacturing sector? Uh, Daryl, I, I think the EWD is perhaps the number one challenge for all manufacturers. Okay, so I've in the last 35 years spoken with numerous manufacturers and EWD is the common denominator, the common uh, challenge for all manufacturers. Um, and and I, I have a couple of comments here. So the first one is we have the best educational system in the world, but we do not have a national workforce training system. Okay, instead we have many, many tra training programs. By that, I mean, if you have a certificate and uh, provided by one program, the certificate may not be recognized by companies. Okay, so what we need, number one, is to have an industry recognized credentialing system in the country and it's built on standards and the proper certification and certificates. And uh, the credentials should be nationally stackable and portable. Okay, so that's number one. And the number two is to take, again, uh, take a regional approach. Employers should collaborate with one another in the region to create statewide industry and work with the community colleges and universities to create a coordination uh, mechanism. And uh, they should work together on defining the knowledge, skills, and ability elements and corresponding competencies. And to embed 
the credentials in their degree programs so that the, the trainees and students can get both a degree certificate and also uh, require the industry, uh, in, require the skills for industry. And the last one is, and now we realize the use of online education and training and the use of AR and the VR technology to accelerate workforce development and retooling of the current workforce for industry 4.0 and the factory of the future. So Liz, I'd be interested in your views on how we can do a better job coordinating on this workforce development uh, question, just in terms of the interface with higher education, the role of community colleges or technical institutes, online uh, platforms and certificate uh, programs. How do we bring all this together in a way that we actually have a coherent system of workforce development? Coherent workforce system is really, uh, I think, one of our my major goals right now. I think that is absolutely the case. As Ben said, it's, it's historically, it's very siloed. Uh, and we have resources that come into regions and states, you know, across many different programs. I'd mentioned, I'd also add to Ben's list, um, our vocational schools, which I think are really um, also an important piece of this this story. So I think we have a lot to build on. There's been a lot of experimentation going on here in the last several years, whether it's by public sector entities, where we see a lot of great um, work coming out of our community colleges, where we see them partnering with industry. We see um, two-year schools working with four-year schools. We see a whole host of experimentation. And I think that's great. And I think we also see this important piece of tying high school to the post-secondary education. How do we get students who are in high school already taking classes and immediately going into additional post-secondary education? We know today that a high school education is not sufficient for um, a pathway career-wise in, in the country going forward. It's certainly not um, enough anymore in the manufacturing space. So how do we create that pathway that brings uh, high school right into the post-secondary education, whether it's we're very excited about registered apprenticeships um, and the administration has got significant you know, resources putting toward trying to grow those uh, in the country. Um, how do we get our community colleges also doing that? And then partnering, as Ben said, with, uh, with the private sector regionally, critically important. But I am very excited about this area because I think that there's an understanding that we need that kind of um, continuity across across that, particularly in that kind of post-secondary area. I think we also, I would say, we need evaluation. We need to make sure we're, we're evaluating what works for, for students because we've got a lot of new exciting certificates that are coming online. We've got a lot of different um, uh, products, if you will, or offerings to students in the marketplace. I don't think we have a very good sense yet, I don't know what Ben thinks, but about their returns for the student, the return for, and which is why we really emphasize this registered apprenticeship. It's a way for us to really measure um, outcomes uh, down the road. So I think the evaluation is critically important. I think that also the whole element of the hybrid learning that has got to be part of our future. Um, the AR VR possibilities. When we uh, was out, I was out talking to firms in my previous uh, job at MIT. You know, a number of firms in trying to introduce this technology, and the trainers would be a little bit threatened by it, you know, that, well, is this AR, VR gonna, gonna sort of take my job because now who's gonna you know, train the students? And actually it turned out to be just the opposite, that it meant that the students could learn through this, through this new you know, means, but it allowed the trainers to actually touch more students and to bring in more material. And so I think that's gonna be something too, again, investments in, these, in our educational institutions to be able to provide that kind of education is gonna be important and important for attracting the next generation uh, to manufacturing, which is gonna be, is one of our long-term um, needs here. I mean, on, in terms of online education, I have always thought there is a natural combination of the human teacher and the technology, just in the sense of the technology can do a good job of communicating basic facts and assessing the students on their knowledge of basic facts, which then would free teachers and professors for higher level functions, problem solving, critical analysis, and uh, so on. So I hope people do not view those as uh, zero sum uh, goals. And Ben, yeah, but, I wanna uh, come back to uh, Liz's point on evaluation, because she was talking about the importance of determining where we are and what we know and where we're going, what works and what doesn't work. And you mentioned 
uh, the importance of a metrics-based approach. Tell me a little bit more about that. Like, how do we think about the role of metrics in all this? What are the right uh, metrics? How do we start to develop an evidence-based approach to uh, these uh, kinds of challenges? Um, on EWD, um, Liz is correct. We have so many uh, certificate programs in the US and some of them are wonderful programs, okay? But the return on investment for the employers and also for the trainees has not been proven, okay? So that is something we need to work on, okay, to validate the return on investment. That's number one. Number two, I think it should be based on standards, okay? And also accreditation systems similar to ABET for the engineering and a technology program. Okay, so those are the, the two things I would like to add to it. Now, the, the metric system uh, for ego system development, um, I, I think most audiences know the TRL, technology readiness level, and most audiences know what MRL is, manufacturing readiness level, okay? And I think it is important for us to mature technology at the same time, we want to develop our manufacturing ecosystem. So when a new technology is ready for production and we have a place to produce it in the US, okay, so that's the realization of invent here, uh, build here uh, in the US. And uh, there's a set of metrics, okay, from the workforce to uh, investment, uh, the local business climate, and even, uh, uh, minority participation, technology, transportation, infrastructure, all these are important metrics for us to evaluate and uh, of the, uh, the manufacturing ecosystem. So one last question for each of you, and then we're gonna move to some audience questions. So Liz, earlier you mentioned the crucial role of infrastructure uh, in improving uh, manufacturing. And of course, all of DC is talking about infrastructure in uh, general. What can we do with infrastructure investment that will specifically aid manufacturers? Oh, well, let me just say the other word that is on everybody's tongue here in Washington, besides infrastructure, uh, the other words are supply chain, which is very exciting for some of us. I think that rarely would we have thought we'd come to a point where people are talking supply chains nationally and certainly in the Beltway, which is um, I think an important piece to this. Um, so I think on the infrastructure front, you know, what it is, what we're talking about is massive and most needed investments in things like railways, ports, um, our train system, our roads, our bridges, all of the what we think of as sort of the basic pieces there, along with things like um, water uh, treatments and, 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 and the like. Um, there are, uh, for all of that, we're talking about a, a first and foremost, a construction industry that is implicated by that, but also the manufacturing of parts and pieces and um, aspects of upgrading. And I think that com com combined with a procurement um, emphasis here um, in the Biden administration provides a lot of opportunity for our manufacturing. The, the sort of foundation behind so much of our, so many of our industries um, is a, a manufacturing base of machinery and fabrication and plastics, et cetera. Um, th there's just going to be a way in which they, we see a sort of ripple effect, I think for our, particularly for our SMEs in, our, in this infrastructure bill. I think it's not, it's not that it's, um, it's not a first order, we're not seeing it in the first order, but the second order behind how you actually do this. You think about when you go to other countries who have you know, invested in their um, high speed rail systems and, uh, and port systems as well. We have a lot, we have a, a long way to go here. And the manufacturing uh, piece of this is going to be critical. And particularly if we can combine it with um, an emphasis on uh, reshoring and rebuilding our supply chains here in the country. And also I wanna emphasize how we innovate into new supply chains. Uh, the previous panel talked about our innovation capacity and capabilities. We see this in advanced manufacturing across a number of different industries. And so it's not necessarily a story of bringing something back as much as it is investing in the new technology that helps us do it better here. And I think we have a, a, a real opportunity across the board to find, find ways in which we're going to actually invent our way into stronger supply chains. 
Ben, we'd love to get your thoughts on infrastructure, what we need to do in that area. Then we're going to take some questions from the audience. Well, uh, Liz is correct in saying that the, uh, the infrastructure is really part of the manufacturing. Okay, without a robust uh, infrastructure, and there is no way for us to expand our manufacturing, particularly going forward with the digital manufacturing. So that is, uh, I mean, these two are, are uh, integral and as uh, from the policy standpoint. Uh, there are, I, I would like to very quickly comment on the importance of uh, the integration of the existing innovation programs and the new programs that the current administration is proposing by taking a whole of government approach. Okay. We, have the, we have some of the best R&D programs and innovation programs in the world. Uh, so the key to success is really to connect these programs together. So from basic research to the proof of concept to prototyping and then production in the US, and I think we need to make it as a continuous innovation value chain coupled with a local manufacturing ecosystem. If we can do that, and I think the manufacturing renaissance is gonna be around the corner. Okay, uh, we're gonna to move to some questions from the audience. And I wanna remind uh, those of you who are watching, if you'd like to submit questions, uh, we have a Twitter hashtag set up at hashtag USMFG, that's USMFG. Feel free to uh, pose any uh, questions uh, that way. Uh, so I have two questions that are somewhat related. So Christopher, uh, who works with the Leadership Networks Organization asks, how can we accelerate upskilling for currently low-skilled workers? And then Milt of Venture Nashville wants to know, what is a bigger constraint on improving the manufacturing sector in the next 10 years, technology innovation or the supply of human workers? So each of them are wanting you to address the human aspects of manufacturing. Those are good questions. I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, upskilling current workers, uh, so critical and something that we, you know, what are our tools for being able to do that? Interestingly, there's some recent research that's come out of um, MIT, my co former colleagues, uh, Ben Armstrong, uh, Bill Bonvillian, and Suzanne Berger have looked at these small and medium-sized firms and asked, you know, how, how, when is it that they adopt new technology? What are the conditions in which that happens? Because as Ben said earlier, one of our biggest challenges for increasing productivity is actually um, investing in technology. And in, in some previous work we did, you know, we're looking, we're looking for more, we were just in, in our interviews with firms, we just thought there'd be much more adoption than we have seen to date, whether it's robotics or 3D printing, et cetera. But what was really interesting was where there was adoption of new technology, there was the upskilling of workers, that those two things go hand in hand. So it's almost like a virtuous cycle that if you're going to, to when are you going to upskill your workers? When are you going to invest in, um, you know, more training, et cetera? It's when you actually move toward greater productivity, greater investment in technology. And so one way I think to do this is to be incentivizing firms and helping firms make that discussion, make that leap. It's these small and medium sensors are understandably very risk adverse and they do not have a lot of capital on hand to be making these significant investments. Um, you know, we need a kind of a, a pull mechanism, mechanism if we can. I think the role of MEPs is critical here. So I think that there's, in my mind, a way in which Technology is very much tied to the upskilling question of exist of incumbent workers, um, and then also I think I have to say I think that the online opportunities are also um, something that didn't exist even a decade ago, where we need find we need to have programs and ways in which we can help workers today gain new skills while they're on the job uh, through a combination of hybrid learning. So they're learning also through uh, online education, but we're also finding ways for them to partner with. Uh, local schools, et cetera, to, to have kind of hands-on learning. Um, in terms of the second question, uh, what was it, the, the constraint, what's the bigger constraint for us on, on technological innovation? Um, I'm going to weigh in on uh, humans. I think that we can uh, create a lot of great mousetraps, but unless we can figure out how we're going to translate that into, um, into new jobs and new um, industries and new opportunities, um, it's not going to, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't lead toward um, the kind of outcomes we want. So 
we have a shortage of workers right now. It is preventing firms from hiring, from growing, from, uh, from making those investments. The reality is a lot of them are actually investing in technology, I think will be our friend here, will helpfully augment workers and fill in, fill in gaps where we can't find workers. Um, but I think we have, to, um, we have to find a way in which we're going to um, really invest in that workforce that's gonna help us grow. And then the technology actually can get you know, implemented and applied uh, as, as those companies are growing. Uh, so Ben, your thoughts uh, either on the upscaling part of that question or the human versus technology role? Well, on upscaling, uh, I think the local partnership is key to a successful uh, upscaling the existing workforce. The, uh, the, the current workers, they cannot move far okay, from their home base. So I think the local vocational schools, uh, two-year colleges, and also the companies, they can work together to identify the gaps and then bring the technology from, for instance, manufacturing innovation institutes to the local MEP manufacturing extension program uh, partnerships, and then train and then upskill the existing workforce. Okay. And then on the human aspect, um, right now the additive manufacturing AI robotics, and there are really new technologies, but five years from now, 10 years from now, almost all companies will have all this and this will become the essential uh, capabilities, okay? So they're gonna have to compete on business models, the innovative business models. And then business models are developed and created by human beings, not by robots or by AIs. So I think the human aspect in the future of manufacturing is even more critical in order to compete well. Okay, I'm glad that each of you voted in favor of humans here. That's reassuring. Uh, so Tracy has a question about marketing manufacturing. She says, is there a marketing problem for manufacturing when it, portrays to, when it pertains to attracting uh, workers in the future? Because she says, people do not see manufacturing as sexy. You know, it's not like technology or mobile apps or other things like that. Uh, and she says, we need to do a better job marketing uh, manufacturing as the tech jobs of the future. So any thoughts or reactions to that? Well, I can just say, I think she's, Tracy's completely right. Uh, and hopefully she's um, on the case and helping with that in whatever um, work she does. But I think, that's, I think that's true. I think also though, we have to recognize that for several decades, we had significant disinvestment in our manufacturing base and it hit, hit very hard in particular communities. And if you were, grew up in those communities and you saw your grandfather or your father lose their job or a lot of the waves of uh, deindustrialization and, and offshoring, there, it is very challenging to say, okay, I'm gonna go enter into that field. And certainly parents are gonna ask twice about that. Um, the, I think the positive piece here is to say, and, and, and Ben said it, I think earlier, but, but we're really in a, a 21st century manufacturing is gonna look extremely different than 20th century manufacturing. It is a completely different um, way of understanding how we're gonna be Doing this is going to be much more technology, much more interface um, with uh, computer systems. Um, you know, if you go into some of these um, some of these facilities now, you'll just see these you know ex clean and um, sort of precision oriented um, in, in places or, or f f factories that I think are very much a different vision than what people have. Um, but the marketing part, I think, I think the thing is it's that we're not gonna be seeing, um, I, I actually think manufacturing is going to have, when we start to see the kind of products that are coming out of manufacturing, when you start to see the way in which it's actually in, um, embedded in so many of our new and um, important kind of industries around uh, biopharma, around uh, clean energy related technologies, um, it, it, we're gonna see a, way, a next generation that actually sees um, there's advantages here or there's something interesting here and that they like to actually work with their hands. That kind of, um, um, that sort of move I think is now happening in this next generation. And even though they're sort of, uh, you know, raised on the software and the apps, um, how that applies to manufacturing, I think can be quite interesting. Uh, ben, your thoughts on this advanced manufacturing thing and how manufacturing actually is going to become tech technological? 
yes, I absolutely agree. Uh, I think the future of manufacturing is digital manufacturing. A lot of high tech, uh, high tech uh, uh, products, devices, machineries, and and tools. Okay, and I recall ten years ago when uh, the advanced manufacturing partnership started, and there were four work streams: technology, infrastructure, policy, and the and the fourth one is the imaging of manufacturing as a career choice. Okay, so the people recognize that. The image of manufacturing uh, may not be as good as some other sectors, but going forward, digital manufacturing is going to be clean, quiet, and also high pay as well. And that also requires uh, really uh, uh, very good skills. Okay. I say clean, quiet, and high pay. That should be a attractor package for uh, young people. Uh, Anna has a question about the design side of manufacturing. I mean, oftentimes in these discussions of manufacturing, we really focus on production. Uh, her question is about design and basically, how can we do a better job involving research and design uh, institutions in developing uh, manufacturing? And what, if anything, is some of the proposed new administration uh, initiatives doing to promote design in America? Uh, Liz, you want me to uh, take this one first? <laughs> Please, Ben. Um, the, the design for X, okay, uh, is really very important. And uh, the, uh, the design actually determines 80% of the cost, okay, even though the real cost uh, happens or incurred during the design stage is only about 15 or 20%, but design actually determines at least 80% of the cost. So design for manufacturing and going forward, design for additive manufacturing, okay, because additive is a very different approach to our production. Design for supply chain, particularly design for resilient and robust supply chain. In the past, it was all lean, but going forward, I think the resilience and robustness uh, are becoming more and more important. So, uh, and design for circular economy, okay, uh, to make it clean, and the reusable, uh, recyclable. So the design is absolutely a crucial aspect in advanced manufacturing. So manufacturing is really not just to make things, it's really to design and make, distribute and reuse. Okay, uh, we have a question from CJ Carter who wants to know what advice would either one of you give to local workforce development boards in order to get people employed in manufacturing. And of course, just for our audience, the Workforce Development Boards are set up in many uh, communities across the country and involve kind of trying to connect uh, businesses with uh, educators to make sure people are having the right skills. So uh, any advice for these local workforce development boards? I can go ahead and just say, you know, I've seen, I think the gr a great work by the Workforce Development Boards in Massachusetts where um, I was, you know, have been for a while in which it's really, again, based on a regional, uh, looking at sort of regional economies and having the workforce uh, boards be very connected to the demand side, understanding both supply and demand in the manufacturing space. I think having that kind of information, that sort of a close relationship that understands where we're seeing uh, gaps, uh, where we see uh, opportunities, that's the first piece to um, being able to solve for some of the workforce challenges. Um, I think a second area for, for the boards is very much the sense of integration across institutions. How can they help with that seamless flow from the high school to the secondary or post-secondary education? Um, what, we, what we've seen is I think that where we can catch students early on and interest them in some of this work um, if we can provide a, a seamless pathway, we can get um, folks through with their certificate, with their degree, and in position in a good position for you know for for that career path. I think it was um, it said in a previous in the previous uh, panel, you know, for the longest time, the emphasis in the certain in the country and in, and perhaps in the sort of general public discourse was that the four year degree was the path, the only path forward towards success. And, and no question the returns to a four-year degree um, 
are hot, higher. Uh, but the fact is four-year degrees aren't for everyone. And we, a lot of people, um, oh, close to 40% start a four-year degree and do not finish within six years. That's a lot of waste of time and money. We need to really be strengthening that pathway toward the middle, pathway toward middle, um, the middle wage jobs to the middle class. And I think the workforce board's focusing on that and focusing on that opportunity for uh, the next generation is, is really where there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. I, I, I'm excited about that shift for us in, in sort of a general shift, I think, in, in the public discourse. I'm really excited about it uh, in terms of the priorities for the Biden administration. Uh, ben, any advice that you have for local workforce development boards? Well, uh, just very quickly, I think first work on the demand side by identifying the KSA gaps and then work with the local two-year colleges, four-year universities, and also vocational schools in developing programs to fill those gaps and make sure the programs are built on standards, okay? And then we want to continue to monitor the return on investment for the employers and also for the trainees. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I have two questions about what's called micro manufacturing. So these are firms with under 20 employees. So uh, the tiny uh, businesses that are out there. So Ilana of Recast City wants to know how will these programs help micro manufacturers scale up and become a stronger part of our domestic supply chain? So basically uh, can micro manufacturers help solve some of these uh, onshoring and global supply chain issues? Uh, and then uh, Kennedy uh, has a related question uh, that is basically, does the Biden administration have any plans specifically for micro manufacturing? Uh, I guess I'll go first, Ben, and <laughs> can sure. respond. Um, so the micro manufacturer, it, you know, a, a critical part of our um, of our manufacturing base. I don't know the exact numbers in terms of numbers, but it, we have a, a a lot of micro manufacturers who fill a niche often making commodity products or, um, or other you know, niche products for their customers and don't necessarily have a tremendous um, uh, capacity for investing in their own growth or growth trajectory. Um, in some previous work that we did at MIT, we used this phrase, you know, these are companies that are often found home alone. You know, how when you were a small firm, you're completely stretched, you, you know, you're, you're you're, you don't have a lot of, you don't have a, a VP for human resources or for R&D or for any of these things. So how do you actually look for ways to grow and to expand and find markets, et cetera? And so I think that there's a, um, a challenge there uh, and there always has been a challenge there. And the question is how can we make sure that these firms become more competitive? Part of that is investing in their equipment uh, and their people. And it's also about figuring out new markets. And I think in terms of programs or approaches to this, um, a couple come to mind, and these are kind of uh, bread and butter programs for the, for the country and, and, and ones that we're investing in um, uh, significantly in the Biden administration. One is, of course, the MEPs that we talked about. That is really the niche for MEPs is to think about the small and medium-sized firms and how do we help them uh, make that next leap and provide the resources that these firms can't provide themselves. And the second, I think, are um, SBA uh, and the role that SBA plays in terms of providing um, basic capital to uh, affordable uh, capital, so to speak, um, to these firms. And particularly for those who have small, you know, uh, small, perhaps, uh, investment needs, but even for a small company to invest, for example, in a cobot, you know, that can make a huge difference in their productivity. Um, and so how do we help those firms understand, first of all, that a cobot could help them? Uh, how do we give them the know-how and the, and the sort of uh, technical assistance to bring in that integration because it's not um, necessarily obvious to these small firms? And then how do we provide the capital to allow them to make that kind of investment? And so I think on all fronts, I think that that's something where we have some existing programs that we are actually reinforcing and, and um, doubling down on in the administration. Um, and then I also want to say that I don't think it's just um, a, a role for government. I think we want to also be looking at ways in which customers and OEMs are also uh, looking to invest and support um, their, their suppliers and finding ways in which they can be incented to, to also do this. Because of the 
the OEMs are only, their sort of technology adoption and their efficiency and their resiliency, as Ben point, you know, points out, is only as good as their supply base. And in a lot of research that's been done um, about supply chains and resiliency, often the weak link is found in that fourth or fifth tier of suppliers. It's the small commodity making supplier that you didn't think about where you, uh, you have some of your you know, weakest link in the chain. So um, I am hopeful we can find ways to, uh, again, bring private sector um, investment in resiliency and that will help the small, small firms. Now that's a great point. And certainly both government and business have some uh, responsibilities uh, in uh, this area. And just going, uh, Liz, going back to a point you made earlier about procurement. Procurement is an area where often large companies that have lots of experience selling goods and services uh, to uh, governments have clear advantages. And these small companies just don't have the staffing to do it. Procurement is complicated. There are a bunch of uh, rules and regulations. Uh, and it's very difficult for them. So procurement reform could be a part of that. But uh, yeah. Ben, any particular advice you have uh, in terms of micro manufacturers? Uh, very quickly, I think the, uh, the best way to, to do it is really to work with local MEP. And the Manufacturing Extension Partnership is really a national treasure. Okay, it has strong presence in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. And it is uh, the, the best uh, manufacturing extension program in the world. And I think we should continue to invest and incentivize uh, the companies to work with MEP and then MEP work with uh, uh, the local companies. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so Jim has an international question for you. He points to other countries, uh, you, know, you know, such as South Korea, that he says has a very dynamic and innovative 21st century manufacturing and basically wants to know why can't the United States do that? Like, what are we doing wrong? You know, is uh, public policy a factor? And I would just add to that, like, you know, we know there are other countries like uh, Germany is a common example that has invested heavily in manufacturing and has a very robust uh, manufacturing sector. Are there lessons the, the United States can learn from some of these other uh, countries uh, as we uh, consider ways to help promote the sector? Uh, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll kick off and I couldn't agree more um, with, uh, with that question that, you know, there are models out there that um, emphasize the role of a, of a public-private partnership in which manufacturing is a high priority for the country and is a, is a sort of foundation for growth and for innovation. And so um, I think we can do that. I think that's what the Biden administration is trying to do with this, uh, um, with this manufacturing agenda, with this industrial strategy uh, in which we see a, a real a focus um, uh, and role for the government to try and fill gaps and to rebuild what has been lost over the last several decades. I think one of the things you see in both of those countries that I wanna emphasize is actually a real investment in labor. And if you look at the German model in particular, there has always been a way in which labor and management are partnering uh, and we see higher wages and we see more support also for the SMEs, whether that's through financing or other, other areas. But if you're investing heavily in your workforce, you then have a very big incentive to increase your productivity because you're trying to get as much as you can out of you know, every hour uh, of, of the workday. Uh, I think that's at first and foremost, one of the pieces here that is part of the Biden administration is to say, let's invest in workers. Let's make sure that we're providing quality jobs. Um, and then the other part is to say, we have, uh, it's in our national interest to have a strong manufacturing base. Uh, I don't think we've necessarily really emphasized that in the past in the way that we're doing this now. And we're identifying through the supply chain work places where we see we have gotten the, the, the system as it stands, which has been very much focused on efficiency and on uh, short-term um, profits, et cetera, has, has become, become untenable uh, when it comes to sort of issues of national security and economic security. And so how can we have a strategy in which we're saying, you know, it matters to us um, that we are able to have some biopharmaceutical capabilities in this country. You know, it matters to us that we need to have um, abilities to make semiconductors uh, in this country. We have a number of areas where I think other countries have made those decisions um, and we're making those decisions now. And I think that that's gonna be helping us uh, build and kind of look, I think, hopefully, uh, not exactly like we have a different system in those countries. We are not, you know, we're much more decentralized. We have a much 
Um, I think uh, a very strong role, an important role for the private sector to play. Um, but nevertheless, I think there's a way in which we can um, rebuild and, and create a, and it's sort of a, a US version of the strong manufacturing base um, that is going to learn, you know, we can learn from those countries and apply it in a uniquely US uh, manner. Ben, uh, any lessons from abroad in terms of what other countries are doing that we can uh, develop here in the United States? I, I think just uh, two quick additions. Number one is the realization that innovation cannot be separated from manufacturing. These two have to come together, tightly coupled. And building on that to create a set of industrial policies uh, to support both innovation and the manufacturing in the U.S. Okay. Uh, so I think we have time for just one more uh, question. Uh, so far, we've basically been talking about American investment in America. Robert has a question about what's called foreign direct investment basically foreign companies investing in America. And of course, there are uh, many foreign companies that actually already are doing this. So uh, he wants to know, what role do these foreign direct investment companies play in improving the manufacturing sector in the United States? Oh, that's a great question. And I think it's um, an obvious, maybe it's an obvious thing to say, they're critically important. We've got a great uh, foreign companies that are foreign based companies that have significant investments in this country. Uh, some of our major um, manufacturers in the country are, you know, are foreign based. Um, you can find them in autos, you can find them in um, electronics, you can find them in a whole host of areas. Um, and often they bring, you know, I think best practices from other countries, particularly when it comes to intro introduction of new technology. Uh, I think you'd find that a lot of the foreign countries uh, companies um, have potentially been quicker to invest in the industry 4.0 technologies. They also have often um, good practices vis-a-vis -vis labor and management. Um, not always, but in terms of investing in their workers and understanding that the workers are kind of what drives productivity growth, I think is very important. What we've seen in some of the companies that we've uh, interviewed, I interviewed certainly my previous job, is that uh, what you can often bring to to uh, a new context is regionally based. So if you see you know, foreign, foreign investment in um, the Detroit region or in um, the Carolinas or something like in that area, whatever their practices are, often there's a spillover effect in which other com companies learn about it or they start partnerships with, with, um, with in educational institutions like they might do in uh, South Korea, like they might do in uh, Japan, and that actually becomes something that becomes a positive here. So I think they play a really important role. I hope we continue to um, attract that investment. And, and it's, it's often, you know, it's not just uh, our market, it's our innovation capacity that often attracts the, um, the international companies. So we have to be very, um, very clear that that's a kind of real asset that we want to be investing in. And your thoughts about foreign investment in improving American manufacturing? Well, I, I agree. I, and I think uh, there are several aspects, the uh, job opportunities and also uh, economic growth resilience by shortening the supply chain and also the national security uh, should be a top priority as well. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, Liz, I wanna thank you very much for joining our conversation. Uh, it's great that you're having a chance to apply your academic expertise from MIT uh, in the White House. So we look forward to seeing the fruits of your activities. And uh, Ben, you've been doing tremendous work at Georgia Tech. So uh, good luck in your uh, ventures as well. To our audience, uh, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. We appreciate your uh, interest. And if you'd like to learn more, uh, we at Brookings write regularly about uh, manufacturing and ways to improve uh, the climate for uh, manufacturing in America. And you can check out our work at brookings.edu. So thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.